What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. Alright, this story's called, I had an office food thief, so I bought a nanny cam. A couple of things about me that made it really suck to have a food thief. I have a lot of food allergies, so I can't just get lunch at the cafeteria or at a nearby restaurant. Ooh. I have a new baby, who I'm breastfeeding, and who I pump for when I'm at work. You know how hungry pregnant people are? Yeah, the caloric requirement for breastfeeding is 1 to 200 calories higher. I am always hungry. Because I have a new baby, half the time, I don't manage to show up at work with a lunch. I either run out of time to pack one, or if I did remember, I leave it on the counter. My solution to all of this was to leave lots of non-perishable snacks in my office, and also a lot of candy, because I also have a three-year-old, and therefore work is the only place I can shovel Skittles into my mouth without a little hand extending into my field of vision and a little voice saying, Please? snacks that were specifically free of my allergens, some of which were specialty foods because of this. The type of specialty food that just doesn't taste as good as the food that contains the allergen, and also costs twice as much. Because I'm not getting a lot of sleep right now. I deserve nice things. So, because I'm not getting a lot of sleep right now, when I first came back from my maternity leave, assembled my snack cord, and started having things go missing, I genuinely thought that I was just losing my mind. Boxes of candy were running out faster than I thought I was eating them. I'd come in the morning and things wouldn't be where I'd left them. At one point, I brought a bag of chips to work, folded the rim of the bag down so I wasn't plunging my arm elbow deep into a grease pit, and then put a bag clip on it when I went home. And when I came in the next morning, the bag was unrolled and reclipped. I went, wow. I must be more tired than I thought. I rolled the bag back down, and the next morning, it was unrolled again. Just little things like that, almost every day, that made me go, wow, the post-baby brain is worse than I thought. And then, and then, then, I got the flu. I got the flu, and I was out for a whole week. Left behind at the office was an almost full box of Enjoy Life cookies, which are not enjoyable, but are free of all major allergens, and are also five bucks a box for like 12 sad little sand pies with cinnamon on top. I ate one row of these cookies, and then I was out of the office for a week. For one week, I wasn't eating any of my snack hoard. But someone else was, because I came back to work, opened my box of cookies, and found one. There was one single solitary cookie left. And on further examination, the one box of candy that had been opened was nowhere to be found. And on top of that, the thief had done me the courtesy of opening a new box for me. Except that they actually followed the push here to open instructions instead of just ripping open one end of the box like I do. Which they should damn well know at this point because by this time, they'd been stealing from me for two goddamn months. The combination of these two things, the sheer freaking audacity it takes to open Open a new box so you can continue stealing from someone on top of the consumption of almost a whole box of specialty cookies that aren't even good enraged me enough that after going to my boss and getting some vague promises about checking if the security cameras in my wing of the building are functional or not, what? I went straight to Amazon and ordered myself a nanny cam. Not for my baby, for my snack hoard. Conveniently, it arrived the day before Valentine's Day. I set it up on top of a file cabinet looking down on my desk. On the desk, I laid out a fantastic spread of baby Eight. <clears throat> snacks. I got all my thieves' favorites. And then, I took it one step further. I bought myself a Valentine heart, 
broke the seal to make it more inviting, and left it out on my desk. The next morning, I came in to some very obvious snack carnage. My thief had slowly been getting more brazen. Again, who opens a new box of something and opens it differently than the person they are stealing from? But this was just on another level. Individually wrapped things had been dumped out of their boxes, bits of packaging had been thrown away, and yup, they'd eaten some of the Valentine candy. For shame, office thief! Don't you know that's from someone who loves me? I played back the video, all was quiet throughout most of the evening, and I was just watching the shadows lengthen as the sun slowly set through the hallway window. And then, shortly before midnight, the night janitor arrived and went right ahead and took a 12-minute break in my office, sitting in my chair, eating my food. I started taking screenshots. I got him shoveling candy into his mouth with full palm-to-lips intensity, pouring things out onto the desk to pick his favorite flavors, not even bothering to put them back where he found them. And Yes, eating my goddamn Valentine's candy. Screenshots went directly to my boss in an email. I went directly to my boss's door to hover and grin and ask if he'd read my email. And I got assurances of a strongly worded email to the cleaning company and the barring of this particular employee from our place of business. I was also, tactfully, asked to please take my unauthorized spy camera home, which I did. I thought this was over, until the girl who works the concession stand dropped by to thank me. Apparently the food thief would start his shift just as she was closing down for the night and would try to get free coffee in that creepy guy way. And then one of the reception staff came by with the same sentiments. I'd never met the guy face to face, but apparently, as a woman, it was not a fun experience to have. I'd shown my screenshots to a few coworkers. Who? Who's eating user 5 rabbits in a long coat's food had become office gossip by this point, and word had spread fast. I worked an earlier shift, so I didn't recognize him, but people whose shifts overlapped with his did. I hadn't told my husband about what I'd done, because when I came home, raging about the blatant theft that'd gone on while I'd had the flu, his only response had been, you shouldn't be leaving food at work then. But when I came home with the nanny cam and explained where and why I'd gotten it, his reaction surprised me. You know, I think this is the first time I've seen you stand up for yourself. I'm proud of you. You know what, Reddit? I'm proud of me too. Hey, I'm proud of you too. That was some sweet justice using that nanny cam and just catching him in the act. Ah, I would, I would have been filled with just complete rage at that point, and I would want to assault a night janitor at his place of living, because that is what happens when you steal my food. However, OP did the right thing and just got him fired, because that guy's creepy and he doesn't deserve to, to work places like that with people. What a jerk. This story's called, I Destroyed a Brewery. Nearly 20 years ago, I was a brewer at a brew pub. The owner was a complete lunatic and an utter a-hole. Before I was hired, he had already purchased the brewery equipment used from a closed microbrewery. Brewery. Brewery. Problem is, it was literally four times larger than it needed to be for the size of the place. And to top it off, he was selling big three beers too. And it was a Pugsley system. Brewers will know. But I made it work. He even got the stupid ringwald yeast to behave. But I only need to brew about three or four times a month. I have worked at places we brew that much a week. So I wasn't needed anywhere near 40 hours a week, and I was salaried. So he decided I needed to work night manager at least two nights a week to fill out my hours. That was fine. It was an easy gig. After our first year, he advertised a huge anniversary event with specials on food and drink, food specials, commercial beer specials, and didn't even mention that we made our own, much less put anything on special. Idiot. Not too long after, I got my first vacation in over a year, and he was mad at me for insisting. But life was stressful, 
not least of which because my mom was in hospice, stage 4 cancer, but her condition was such that she said my wife and I should go, she'll be fine. So we went camping for a week. The day before our trip was to end, we got word she had died two days earlier. My family didn't know how to reach us, only she did. We rushed home, six hour drive, and on the way, I called my boss and told him what had happened, and that I probably would not be in on Monday as planned. This was Saturday. I found out later from a bartender that he then complained at the chef that I was probably going to want more time off. I did in fact take Monday off, but I went in on Tuesday to do my night manager shift. Now, my mom's wishes were to be cremated, with no embalming. So by the time I got home, she was already cremated. So the memorial service was planned for two weeks later, right before Labor Day weekend. There was to be a memorial service Thursday and the interment for the family Friday. So I planned and made sure that the servers were full and I wouldn't need to brew for at least a week. That Wednesday, the boss comes and tells me he wants me to work night shift on Thursday and Friday, normally I did Tuesday and Wednesday nights, to make up for the time off I'd taken to help my dad out. He wasn't handling it well. He wanted me to come in after my mom's funeral. I flatly refused, at which point he said fine, but I'd have to work a double shift Saturday then. I nearly lost it. I walked away, and after I cooled off, I went back and told him I was no longer going to do the manager shifts and that I wanted to switch to hourly for brewery work only. He was angry but stuck. He needed me in the brewery. Things started calming down, but after a few weeks, I noticed that my paychecks were for less than I anticipated. I hadn't been tracking my clock in, clock out very closely because prior to this, I only clocked in and out, so I was logged in to do manager functions. But I happened to have a couple of slips in my wallet, and because I still had manager access, discovered he had been altering my hours, eventually cheating me out of 20 20 hours in just 6 weeks, and that's when I hatched my plan. I was done with this a-hole. Remember that ringwood yeast? Well, in a brewery, hey, you harvest yeast from a fermenting batch to use to brew a later one. And since we were slow, it often had to be stored for a while before it got used. But you had to use it within 30 days. 21 is better, or it goes sour and starts dying. Normally, I would take other steps to ensure it stayed clean and healthy, but not on the last batch I harvested. It just went into the cold room and stayed there. I stopped going in very often, just logging tank levels to make sure nothing ran out and made him suspicious. I would even go in to make sure he wasn't in that day, and later message him that I'd brewed, I hadn't, and waited. On day 45. After I got the check for the last hours I worked, I overnighted my keys in with a resignation letter. He called me the next day, screaming. I told him I knew what he'd done and I wouldn't be back. I don't know what he looked like when he went into the brewery cellar and discovered he had empty fermenters, nearly empty serving tanks, dead yeast, and almost no grain. Pity, really. After that, he tried to hire my former assistant who was working at another brew pub by then because the a-hole had forced me to fire him to save money. He laughed at him. He then apparently got the underage son of one of the brewers at a nearby pub, which he had originally been part of to brew for him, but had to fire him because the kid kept getting caught getting drunk down in the cellar. So he tried doing it, and I had heard they stopped brewing entirely eventually. About a year after I left, he folded. Staff showed up one morning to padlock doors. Drove through there a few years back, not only gone, but building was torn down. I felt like stopping to sow the ground with salt. But I was in a hurry. Okay, so I came in here expecting him to do some, uh, <laughs> chemistry, some brew chemistry to cause, like, an explosion from pressurized gases or something, and that would have been cool, um, but that would have been more nuclear revenge. So, but I guess for pro-revenge, it fits. <laughs> But yeah, that's a really cool story. Glad you uh, made him realize that he was an idiot and a jerk. A jerk idiot. 
All right, this story's called Killed a Tow Company with One Simple Phone Call. I killed an entire tow company with one phone call with a drone strike? On mobile, so bear with me. Several years back, I went to work for a towing company. It's about all I know how to do other than paint cars, which is drastically affecting my health. The pay was pretty decent, but we had to share trucks, and the boss felt that he knew where we needed to sit in order to get the best calls. This is important for later. Several months in, I realized that I was not making the type of money that I should be making, so I took the opportunity while I was sitting in a parking lot one evening to start researching the laws pertaining to employees in similar positions. He was kind of a butthole, and the trucks had transponders so that he could see if we had them idling with the air conditioner on and on a hot day, or idling with the heat on on a cold day. He was always calling and complaining about something if the wheels were not turning. During my research, I discovered that if he was requiring us to sit in a certain parking lot, street, or any location of his choosing, that we were entitled to be paid an hourly wage, not just our commission. The technical term was engaged to wait. However, if he allowed us to freely roam about while we waited for calls, we were not entitled to hourly wages and we were therefore considered waiting to be engaged. I never mentioned this to him him, but I did start taking note of my time. Another month or so goes by, and he decided to start coming down on me for tiny little beaver sausage. <laughs> Things that ordinarily wouldn't even matter, such as, I forgot a pop can in the cup holder. He actually had a screaming fit about that. At this point, I was tired of working there and had already found another job, so I decided it was time to put my plan into motion. I called him up, told him that we needed to have a conversation about my final wages, and that we could meet at his convenience. Upon entering the office, I laid out my argument, explained the statement law and told him I expected to be paid for the hours that I was on the clock, but not freely allowed to roam looking for work or able to do things of my choosing. He told me in no uncertain terms would not I would not be paid for that time, as that was agreed to upon my employment. I did not bother to argue, as I already had my next step planned. So I took my final check and I left. The following Monday, I made a phone call to the state labor board where I laid out my case to them. Needless to say, they were very interested in what was going on. In the end, they came to review his employment records and speak to the driver still working. When he got the bill of what he had to pay us all, it was too much for him to afford. So he sold the trucks, his boat, and lot, and went out of business. I never got the money owed to me in full, only a fraction. But the satisfaction of knowing the law just a little bit better than he did and watching it all burn was pure bliss. Oh, I was wondering what would happen if someone couldn't pay what was owed to someone in a lawsuit. So, they just don't get the money? That's lame. I thought I felt a bug crawling on my foot. Oh my god, that scared the crap out of me. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.